From Psalm 19, 7 through 14. The law of the Lord, be, the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do these glasses make me look smart? Wow, you guys suck. Okay, so I'm going to read it from the message version. The revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold, bling, bling, with a lifetime guarantee. The decisions of God are accurate, down to the nth degree. What is that? I don't even know what that is. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. You'll like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red ripe strawberries. There's more. God's word warns, of, warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over your work. Then I can start this day sun-washed, scrubbed clean of the grime of sin. These are the words in my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. Oh God, my altar rock, God, priest of okay, my altar. Thank, thank, thank you for this occasion to give you just a little bit more of our mind, of our heart, of our attention. Uh, God, we pray that you would take this moment and, and um, multiply it. Uh, grow it uh, to where it becomes even bigger than what we could grow on our own, God. We do love you. We do honor you. We do respect you in this place. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You were here, I think maybe last Tuesday, I mentioned that uh, each time you see Jess and I up here this semester, we're going to be um, doing a series. So typically we do like these one shots, right? We, we talk about a certain subject, and then the next time you see us, we'll, we'll preach about another subject. But this semester, while we're still in the lens of Christ's theme, uh, each time you see Jess and I up here, we're going to be uh, adding to a series. And that series is called 10 Things God Hates and 10 Things God Loves. 10 Things God Hates. 10 things God, God loves. And each time we get up here, we're going to try to get, at, get as many of them out as we can. I'm going to try to tackle four today. And then, uh, and then uh, if anybody is a, a WWE or WWF understander, Jess and I are going to tag team. And uh, next time I'll tag him in and he'll do his three or four. Amen? And so if you want to um, catch the whole series, then just pay attention to... Uh, when, when we're going to be speaking, and you'll get that. Or, as usual, you can catch the videos uh, or the audio on, um, on the Campus Ministries Facebook page. Now, listen, before I jump into this series, I just want to say this real quick. You know, this title seems pretty concrete, pretty straightforward. God hates this. God loves that. I don't want you to be tripped up into thinking that we're, we're trying to bind you into some legalistic idea uh, of anything, much less... Uh, God's, God's uh, impression of us. Amen? Uh, but I want you to hear it um, in the spirit that it's given, and it's just for guidance and for understanding and for biblical content. Now, here's the thing, too, that's going to be interesting about this series that we're doing. Probably more than normal, um, we're going to be referencing uh, Scripture. And because I don't want to stand up here and tell you stuff that God loves or hates, and it's just my opinion of what God loves or hates. Amen? Because then that's really what Michelle loves or hates, you know, 
under the guise of I think God might hate this as well. Um, so if you, are, if you are a common Bible reader, then these, some, of the, some of the scriptures I think might be familiar to you. If not, if you're not, then um, I would suggest that you become a little bit more familiar with, with the text. Or you could just trust me. I would recommend and prefer that you not trust me, as trustable as I am. Amen? I would suggest you not trust me and that you check. That you check. Um, you don't even have to go buy a Bible these days. You can download it free uh, from any digital site. So, so here we go. That's enough of the intro of it. So let's jump, let's jump into it. This is how this series kind of started for me. A few years ago, uh, something happened in our, digital, in our digital world where never before in all of the history of the world have we been so privileged to know what people think and what people are doing than we are in this age. Because of our social media, we can turn on our computer or turn on our phone or whatever and instantly be flooded with people's opinions about anything, right? When, two, uh, when, when Facebook started in 2004, I believe it was, the subject line, the status bar, it had one question. And the question there was, what are you doing? Anybody remember that? When it first started, the question, the prompt in that field was, what are you doing? And that opened up for everybody to say, I'm walking my dog, I'm washing my hair, I'm baking cookies, I'm hanging with my girls, doing stuff I ain't supposed to, whatever. Right? But the question was, what are you doing? But in 2010, Facebook and Twitter changed their question from what are you doing to what's on your mind. Right? They changed the question from what are you doing to what's on your mind. And with that one change of the question, open the portals of minutia and trivia and nonsense that we should never even have to know about. <laughs> right? Here's what I think about this. Here's what I feel about that. Here's what I want to know about this. Why is this happening? Here's what I think about. Here's, here's, here's. Here's what I love. Here's what I hate. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how I feel about it. Here's the sub message I want to send to the boy who just broke up with me. I hope he reads it. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. You ain't got to tell me. I know. Subposting is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Because you know who people are talking about. And you're like, ooh, did you see? You know what she's talking about. You know what he's talking about. Right? So it op this one question opened up this notion that people could just spew all day long their opinions about anything their interests about anything, their preferences about anything. And we just kind of scroll up and down the page, and depending on whether I care, I'll stop and read whatever it is you're telling me that you love or you hate today. If I care, I'll stop, I'll read it, I might comment. If I don't care, I'll keep scrolling, right? But that one uh, switch up of a question changed how often people engage and how much people engage. And I had this question one day. I said, you know, what if God had a Facebook page or a social network page? And, and, and that was the question. What's on your mind, God? And God put up what was on his mind. My question was, would we even care what God would put up as what's on his mind or what's on his heart? Would we care or would we keep scrolling? If God put up the things he loves and the things that he hates, Would we scroll past it or would we stop for a second and go, hmm. And that's kind of what this series is all about. I'm just going to show you, Jess and I are just going to show you some things that the scripture says God loves and hates. And kind of like you would do on a social network, the, idea, the question is, do you care? The question of what God loves and hates is an important question. But the second question, I think, is more important than the first question. It is, do we care? what God loves or what God hates. Amen? And so that's what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is, let me try to, today I'm going to spend a lot of time getting us on the same page um, so that as we unpack all this stuff that we're thinking with the same definitions and we're thinking with the same context. So I know the words love and hate are for sure common words, probably the most overused words in the English language. Uh, so let me, uh, give us some con let me give us some definitions that we're going to work with. Love is this, to have a profoundly passionate liking need or affection for something, something that is deeply embraced and pleasing. So when we talk about something that God loves, we're not talking about something that, is, that he's amused by. We're talking about something that God absolutely adores. 
that he adores it, that he is drawn to it, that he is pleased by it, that he makes himself comfortable and cozy with it. So when we say God loves this, it's not just, oh, God kind of is tickled by this little thing. We're saying, no, God draws himself to this thing. He is absolutely pleased and adores it. When we say hate, hate is this. It's a, it's a dislike, to dislike intensely, to feel extreme aversion for or hostility towards, extreme hostility towards, to disdain, to detest, to despise. So when we say God hates something, it's not that God finds something annoying or, or, or irritating. It's that he abhors it. He cannot stand it. He can, I hate Brussels sprouts. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and of all the foods that I can say that this definition applies to, it would be Brussels sprouts for me. I hate, I mean, if you put it down in the cafeteria right now, I don't even want to go in the cafeteria if they're serving Brussels sprouts. I hate, I am repelled by little small cabbages. They stink, they're salt. I don't like them at all. <laughs> God hates it. He abhors it. He pushes away from it. He detaches from it. He cannot stand it. It is not mildly irritating. He can't stand it. When I created this little, go back to the, uh, the or go forward, yeah, there. When I created this little promo card for this teaching series, I purposely inserted um, a small thing that would speak to me on this subject, even if nobody else got it. When I wrote the first 10 things, I used the number 10, right? And when I wrote the second 10 things, I used the word 10. Now, according to grammatical rules, you're supposed to have the same tone and the same rules all throughout uh, a literary work. Amen, college people? Right? So when I look at this, when I look, even if nobody else catches it, I did this on purpose for myself because I look at this and it bothers me because I know what the literary rule is, and I know that this goes counter to the literary rule, so every time I look at it, I want to change it because I know that it's counter to the literary rule. And so I kind of I look at this for myself like, you know what, there are things in my life that when God looks at it, he's drawn to it or he's bothered by it. Amen? And so, again, that's just sort of a thing that sort of, that, that, that sticks in my crowd. Every time I look at it, I think, okay, well, I want to think about it this way. It's not, here's the thing. Can I say to God, God, can I do what I'm doing? Can I continue to do what you love? Or can I continue to do what you hate? Yeah, you can. I've given you the gift of free will. From day one, I gave you the gift of free will. You can do whatever you want to do, boo. <laughs> the question is, does it matter to you? Do you want to change it so that it lines up? I would like to change it so that it lines up with literary rule, but I didn't because I wanted to speak to me while we do this series. Amen? All right, as I told you before, I'm going to be using the Bible as our, uh, as our text. Uh, so let's get used to that. Amen? Let's get at it. And, oh, let me just say this last thing. I'm not going to, I'm not, if, for all you RCM majors and people who study preaching and all that stuff, I'm not going to bother myself with, like, really good transitions and really good segues. So don't even take notes. I mean, take notes, but don't take notes on that. I'm going to say, God hates this, God hates that. God loves this, God loves that. Whether they connect or not, I'm just going to jump. Amen? God loves this. Here's number one and two. God loves those who love him. God loves those who love him. And number two, God loves those who obey his commands. God loves those who love him, and he loves those who obey his commands. We're going to find this in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 and 7. In the seventh chapter of Deuteronomy, we find ourselves right after Moses brings down uh, the Ten Commandments, and, this, and he delivers those to the people that God has brought out of uh, captivity from Pharaoh. Now, I know in this age of Hollywood movies, we've seen this a million times. It looks all glossy and glamorous where Moses just kind of comes down, gives the people the tablets, and everybody's happy and turned up. But that's not actually how it goes, right? In the scripture, it's actually, it, it takes a lot longer. It's a lot more tedious. And actually, when Moses gets down to bringing the people the word of God, when Moses gets to bringing people the commandments, it actually gets to meet with a bit of disgruntlement. Like, what took you so long? And where you been? And where's the Kool-Aid? What's up? 
right? So they meet with Moses, they get the Ten Commandments, um, and it's met with some friction, right? Uh, and it's in chapter 6, though, that we finally see these people, these people who are hard-headed and roughneck, right? We see these people finally say to God, thank you, God, for saving us from Pharaoh and from bringing us out of Egypt and out of bondage. And then they finally say this. This is when we get around to chapter 7. They finally say, God, we've been hard-headed. We've been stubborn. We've been rebellious, and we've just been irreverent towards your word. But now we've come to a place, God, where we believe and we say that you are our God and we are your people. And God approves of their response, their final response, their finally response. And then he sends the people away to kind of go prepare for what's coming next. But he tells Moses to hang around for a minute. I want to talk to you a little bit more, Moses, because I want to help. I want you to go explain some things to these people. And so this is what God tells Moses that he wants him to further explain to the people. In chapter 7, verses 7 through 9, it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were the most numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful, he is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. I want to read that in the message because I want it to be even clearer. In the message version, it reads like this. He wanted Moses to say to the people, God wasn't attracted to you and didn't choose you because you were big and important. In fact, there was almost nothing to you. He did it out of sheer love keeping the promise he made to your ancestors. God stepped in and mightily brought you back out of a world of slavery, freed you from the grip of King Pharaoh of Egypt. Know this, God, your God, who you now claim, is indeed God, a God you can depend on. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. In essence, God is saying this, I did not because of you disrespectful people. He said, I did this because of the people before you, your ancestors who loved me and asked me to keep a promise, who I made a promise to. I did this because they loved me so much that I would keep my promise even to their children's children. In the, in the old church, in the old Pentecostal African-American church, the old saints would say, somebody else loved God enough for you and them both. Amen? And what, this, what he's saying here is that God is responding to the people who did love him, not to the hardheads, not to the stubborn. He's responding to the people that loved him, and he's actually keeping his promise. You are the beneficiary of him keeping his promise to the people who did love him and the people who did keep his commandments. Does that make sense? And it's not because you're so great. It's because of the people who did love me in spite of you that I'm keeping my commandments. Some of us are sitting on the blessings of God's love and grace and mercy, not because of ourselves, but because somebody loved him enough for us. And we ought to be grateful for that. Amen? God loves those who love him. God loves those who keep his commandments. Some of us, me included, often cry out, God, I want to feel your love. Anybody ever said that? God, I want to feel your love. God, I want to feel your, your comfort. God, I want to feel your arms around me. God, I don't feel you. God, I want to feel you. And God's response is, Michelle, I want you to keep my commandments. God's commandments are the carriers of his love. They're the caveats of his love. They're the tray that he walks his love to us in on. If you keep my commandments, God's commandments are not restrictions for restrictions sake. His commandments, again, are his carriers of love to and for us. God's first commandment to man was be fruitful and multiply. A lot of us have been raised to think that God's commandments are all inclusive of the word do not. 
Don't do this, don't do that, don't have this, don't do that. All the stuff you like doing, don't do. God's actual first instruction to man was be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. And then after that, he says, now here are some commands to help, you in, to help you protect the life that I want you to enjoy. I don't know about you, but when I was a young girl growing up in Mississippi, which probably most of you were not, I really felt like my mom's commands were destined to just ruin all the pleasure I could get out of life. When I was a little girl, one of her commands was be home before the streetlights came on. Anybody else? Be home before the streetlights came on. Now listen, I live in Mississippi. This, you know, it don't get dark till 10. But the streetlights came on at 6. Right, there's a problem with this equation. Be home before the street. As a teenager, one of her rules was, you don't go outside because a boy honks the horn. Honey, I was happy. If they honked the horn, I was happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you calling me? Yeah. She says, you don't go outside because some boy drives up and honks the horn. You make him come to the door. You make him come to the door and greet me. I was like, if he greets you, he's going to be scared of you because I'm scared of you. <laughs> right? As a, as a young adult, she would... Uh, she wouldn't just let me apply for jobs at fast food restaurants. She said, you apply for a job at a bank. You apply for a job at a hospital. You apply for a job at TV stations. I, I promise you, I felt like all of her commands were to suck the life and the joy out of my life. But obviously, as you get older, you realize that her commands, what? Were to give me a better life. Her commands were how she loved me. Her commands were how she said, I need to protect you so that you can have the best life possible. Same with God's commands. God's commands are not restrictions for, restric for restriction's sake. God loves those who love him and those who keep his commands because that's a loving response to his love. Even we who are made in the image and the likeness of God, we love those who love us. Amen? God loves those who love us. Him and he loves those who keep his commandments, not because he just likes you to keep commandments. He loves those who keep his commandments because that means we're responding to his gestures of love. Amen? Moving fast. Let's look at what God hates real fast. A couple things God hates today. Truth be told, more of us are concerned about what God hates than about what God loves because we want, we want to know how much trouble we're in. Uh, but let's look at a couple things God hates. The first thing God hates that I'm going to talk about today, and mind you, these are in no particular order of importance. So like what I'm talking about today is not more important than what Jess is going to talk about when he talks. Uh, but here's, here's the first thing God hates today. He hates arrogance. He hates arrogance. And the second thing God hates is lying. We find that he hates arrogance. I'm, let me take you there. I think, do we have this, uh, Sierra, in Proverbs chapter 6? So there are six things the Lord hates. Seven are detestable to him. We'll come back to that in a second. Seven are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to evil, a witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in community. God hates, first of all, let's go with this one. God hates arrogance. Now, let me, let me, let me say this. We get arrogance and conceit mixed up a little bit, right? Conceit is this. Go to, go to the next one. Conceit or arrogance is this. Having, assuring, an exaggerated opinion of oneself as related to others. Conceit is an excessively favorable opinion of oneself. It's an exaggerated confidence. One could say that there's nothing inherently wrong with conceit because conceit can be contained. You can be conceited right now and nobody really knows. Like, you could be sitting here right now with an excessively high opinion of yourself. Put your hand up. It's like, no. <laughs> you can be conceited, and it just really be conceited for, for your own sake. You just feel excessively favorable about yourself. Arrogance is when your conceit uh, has to have a, um, how do I want to say it? Arrogance is when, is a whole other level of conceit. It's, a, it's an evolution of Conceit, right? Evident arrogance is when you must make your excessively favorable opinion of yourself known to everyone else. 
Arrogance is a demonstration of conceit that not only exalts itself, but exalts itself over others and seeks to be exalted. Some of us get so fancy with our arrogance and with our exaggerated conceit that we actually get arrogant with God. You don't want to say you do, but you do. We might not say it with our lips, but we live in such a way where we say, my opinion of things, God, is more important and more right than your opinion of things, God. To which God has a response. In Isaiah chapter 42, uh, and I really want to read that, so I'm, it's going to take a minute, but let's read Isaiah chapter 42, starting in verse 1. He says this, is this going to, yeah. He says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. He's talking about you and me. I will pour my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teachings the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord says, the creator of heavens, who stretches, who, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all the things that spring from it, who gives breath to his people and life to those who walk. On it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you a co make a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Verse 8, he says, here's his response to our arrogance. I am the Lord. That is my name and I will not yield my glory to another or praise idols. Let me explain it this way. The first part of this text, 40, uh, Chapter 42, verses 1 through 7, God is like, you are amazing. You are great. You can do amazing things. You have greatness in you. You have power in you. You have justice in you. You have the will to make things happen in this earth. You are the... Right? He says, you're pretty, you're, you're pretty bad. You, you can do some things. But then in verse 8, he says, but I need you not to forget that I am the Lord. You're pretty awesome, but you ain't the Lord. You're pretty great, but you ain't God. You didn't do this and this and this and this. You didn't do all that. You did some things. You've done some things. But you didn't do stuff I do, and don't you forget it. God is not bothered by our greatness. God is not bothered by our self-importance. God is not bothered that we feel good about ourselves and we feel good about our capacity. God is not bothered by that. But God hates when us feeling good about ourselves steps over into arrogance, arrogance so much so that we say we can do better than God. We can think better than God. We can decide better than God. God's like, I'm not scared of you. I created you to be amazing. I created you to be great. But watch that line where great becomes arrogant. Why? Because I can't stand it. I hate it. I detest it. I draw away from it. When you think you're so great that you don't need, then you can do it on your own. Let's see how that turns out. The second one, I got to move fast. God hates Lying, you'll find it in the same chapter of Proverbs. God hates lying. Lying is defined as to be deliberately untruthful, deceitful, false, deceptive, misleading, fallacious, a sham, a counterfeit, a fake. He hates it. Abhors it. Here's, I'm going to make this real simple. God hates lying so much that it's in the Ten Commandments. Drinking is not in the Ten Commandments. Somebody just got happy. Smoking. <laughs> smoking is not in the Ten Commandments. Homosexuality is not in the Ten Commandments. Fornication is not in the Ten Commandments. Profanity is not in the Ten Commandments. Lying is in the Ten Commandments. And we talk about lying like it's cute, it's nothing, it's not. I mean, I just hold a little lie. It's, in the, it's not, and listen, I gotta, let me say this. Listen, lying is not just an activity. It's not just an act. Lying is a spirit. 
Lying is a spirit that is counter to the spirit of God. In the eighth chapter of John, it says that Satan is the father of lies, and that is his native tongue, lying. I know you're lying because your lips are moving. That's Satan's language. I know we don't talk about that a lot here. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So if you don't like it, that's, hey, 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 I, hey, I didn't write it. When we live lying lives, we don't even speak the language of Christ. We think lying is cute and it's not noteworthy. It's not really a noteworthy character flaw. But consider this. People go to prison for lying. Right alongside murderers and rapists and, and thieves and burglars, people go to prison for lying. But we reduce it down to it ain't that big. It's not, I mean, it's nothing. The scripture says God hates lying. John 4 says this, that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In essence, Jesus is saying to the woman at the well, God can't do anything with us until we say we're going to tell the truth. You can't even navigate what you write until you're walking in truth. Even if your truth is bad. Even if your truth is, I'm really messed up. He hates lying. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing. In over two decades of ministry, of the time I've been in leadership ministry, there's only been one person that I couldn't do work with, that I couldn't do ministry with. And it was one of my musicians because he lied to me. And he lied to me knowing that I knew he was lying, and he kept lying. I said, I can't work with you. Because if you will look at me and you will lie to me, that means that nothing that we do has any foundation. Our whole system, our whole societal system works on the idea that people are telling the truth. Amen? The whole idea is that people are telling, that people are being truthful, even if the truth sucks. God said, I hate lying. I hate your deceptive ways. He hates arrogance. He hates lying. He loves those who love him. He loves those who keep his commandments. The question is, I'm going to ask it every time, do you care? Do we care what God loves and what God hates? Does it matter to you what God loves and what God hates? The scripture that Molly and Hakeem read at the beginning of service, uh, I don't know if we have that, but let's put that back up. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But essentially, from verses 7 through verses 13 in um, Psalm 19, it talks about the law of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the way of the Lord, the, the precepts of the Lord, and how much weight they should have and they do have. And at the bottom of it, the writer says, God, let the words of my mouth and let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Essentially, he's saying, God, let me care about what you love. Let me care about what you hate. Let me be pleasing. Let me be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Let the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this time, for this moment, for I think the deeper places we're going to go with these series. God, I pray that you will give us the want to care about what you love and about what you hate. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.